Can you hear me okay? Yes, the recordings are posted, but I realized uh, last night that somehow I, the director one was not recorded. So they should be in the page where it says presentation number one, two, or three, and then the recording should be there. Have you looked there? Okay, the recordings are with the presentation because that's where the PowerPoint is. And then the recording, which would be us uh, recording the entire thing via Zoom, including the PowerPoint. So you should be going on to the presentations and reviewing those because that's how you're gonna be able to understand the best of what's going on. We're gonna look quickly at the to-do for this week. From Canvas, uh, this is our PowerPoint, but I'm gonna try and go to the Canvas from there. Okay. Can you see my, oh, that's bad. What's going on there? Did I just lose our Canvas page? Okay, I'm gonna stop the share. Sorry, somehow our Canvas page disappeared. Let me find it. <clears throat> okay. All right, we're going to go to our Canvas page and uh, let me get that happening. Just a little bit. Okay. So on our Canvas page, under your modules, which are the <clears throat> the weekly, how we handle how the course is organized by week. This thing of the to-do list gives you what should be done for the week. The presentations are the place where the recordings would be. So if we look at this page, this is presentation one, week five, the production team, the introduction to it, showing uh, stage scenery, costumes, a set with audience. There is an interview with a director here. And then designers, there are videos for each specific design element. Costume designer, designing and making a set. The art of sound design, lighting design, working in the theater projection design, special effects designer. And then right here is where the um, recording will be and the PowerPoint. And usually I put in a place marker so we can look at another one that has one in it. so that you are able to find those. So for example, let's see if I, presentation number one, here's the one from last week, collaboration and language, the PowerPoint, creating character, Okay, right, that was the day I was absent. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't actually talk it to myself, but the PowerPoint is in there. So let's go back one. Right here, under the presentation, dramatic forms, the PowerPoint, here's the recording. So they're always gonna be under the presentations. And you know what, I'll send out a notification about that. I thought I did. But you know, I um, 
I'm taking a PE class and I had the hardest time finding the recordings the first few times too, because we're supposed to be actually do we do a zoom and then we're supposed to be working out to the recording. So it's very difficult. Okay. And, and so I understand that if, but um, had you not ever found them before at all, William? Can you just give me a thumbs down? Wait a minute, let me go back. Okay, yeah, Oedip there's only two recordings per week. So the Oedipus doesn't have a recording. And then there's on, certainly on weeks one, two, and three, there's definitely two recordings per each. And they are, they've been to YouTube and they're, they can be captioned and all that. So you can find them. I'll just make sure I check that number four, the director recording, because it takes a long, it takes a while to track it down through YouTube. And then I have to repost and make sure that it's all working. So let's go to <clears throat> our topic for today, which is design. And we're going to look at Let's, we're going to look at the designer link, the presentation page first, and then we'll go to the, oh, we just looked at it. You looked at it, so please watch those videos. If we have time today, we may be able to watch one or two of those, but they will also help amplify the, um, the job of the designer. I realize that the book is very much slanted towards the uh, larger arts, towards the male uh, traditionally male arts. In other words, they have a pretty big discussion on scenic, a pretty big discussion on lighting and on sound, where they talk about the background of it, the historical value of it, and yet they don't talk about the background of costume design. And that's typical, I think, because costume design is the purview of women primarily. Women were seamstresses. A seamstress was a euphemism for a prostitute. If you were in um, like the gold rush in Seattle, and you said you were visiting the seamstress, it meant you were going above the saloon to the prostitute. So, you know, in the time of Me Too then, um, it's, it's a very interesting thing to point out that costume design has always been not quite equal. So in the world of film, production designers often get twice as much as costume designers per week. So that's something that the Costume Designers Guild, which is the IATSC Union for Costume Design, has really been working to, to have equality in pay. And with the United Scenic Artists, Local 829, which handles all theater designers, there is an equality across the board based on the amount of work. And we've worked very hard for that for the last 10 years. So, you know, there's some, there's some movement, but it is still pretty, um, onerous that women are paid less than men. Let's take a look at our PowerPoint and then I'll, um, I will, wait, I got to share it first. Sorry about that. Um, and then we'll start that, the lecture on design. I will try not to editorialize too much, but of course, you know, I have a lot of experience in this, so I will editorialize. Here we go. That's not what I want to do. There we go. Okay. Let's go to the beginning of design. The idea of design is to focus the audience attention in the theatrical space. So the scenic designer is the one we think about most often because it seems to be the element, the largest element that we see as an audience. It is pre-existing. Uh, often when, when the audience arrives, there's something already on stage. So it is sometimes the most obvious of design elements. The scenic designer shapes the stage space. In other words, the stage is a blank. It, there is nothing there. Uh, when you actually work professionally, you don't, there is absolutely nothing there. There's no lighting, there's no soft cloth, there's no curtain, there's no anything. It's a, it's a big box. 
So the scenic designer works from the ground out. And you remember when we looked at um, Chasing Broadway Dreams, you saw that that stage space come to life. The scene designer creates an environment for the actor. Let me get rid of this. My cursors. I have this. As, oh, dear. Okay. Are you seeing my pictures too, you guys, or just the screen? Okay, it creates an environment for the actor and usually in three dimension, but may not be in three dimension. Okay, you know what, I have to go grab somebody. Just a sec. They're in the waiting room so I can see that. Okay. Here we go again. Okay. So we'll go right to the next piece. So the scenic designer shapes the stage space, creates an environment for the actor. Usually that's in three dimensional. It can be in one dimension. I mean, it can be in two dimension. It can be a flat piece, but it is very specifically selected. And that's the important thing to remember is whatever you're seeing has been chosen specifically for that play, whether it's a lot of furniture, a lot of scenery, or whether it's nothing. And sometimes we say that, you know, the scenery shouting the play, it's a, like overdone. And there's designers that really do overdone scenery. Like too much. There's designers that are minimalists. And then there's designers that don't actually just, they just don't finish the, they just don't finish the design. It seems unfinished. So there's a, there's quite a wide variety of people that work um, in a variety of ways. So they make visible the world of the play. We're going to spend a lot of time in this idea of the world of the play. What is the world of the play? Hopefully it makes the play more interesting. The background of scenic design is it started in the 19th century as a scenic artist, creating a painted background to indicate place. The, scene, the job of scenic artist is still existing and very, very important today even though they're not necessarily painting backdrops, there's a lot of three-dimensional uh, faux painting that goes on in theater for every single thing. Even if you're building a, a, a simple table, you might be then enhancing the three-dimensionality of it with painting. The new naturalism was when scenery was dictated by realism to feel photographically real. The, audience wanted to see their living room up on stage and that was what the scenic designer's job was. The scenic artist evolved into the scenic designer. So once we got beyond that flat backdrop, we started putting furniture and walls and curtains in front of that. The scene designer was creating an expression of the entire play. The reactions to realism, instead of just putting all that stuff on stage so that you looked exactly like your living room were expressionism, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Symbolism, where a designer chooses an image that they think represents the key themes of a play and to interpret this as a stage set. Um, we did this once with a Chagall painting for Fiddler on the Roof. So I'll show you an um, example of that. Not all set design has to be large scale. Minimalist sets use pieces of stage furniture or props to indicate a setting or location. We did a, play, a wonderful, amazing, magical play called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime in the Spring. And it simply had 10, 10 boxes that could become luggage, could become chairs, could become a train station, could become a subway, could become a number of different things on a checkerboard floor with very specific lighting indicating the different subways and the trains and the actors themselves also creating the set pieces. The actors became a bed, the actor became a milkshake, the actor became a dog, a key. So there's, that would be definitely a minimalist set. 
selective realism, heightens certain details of the action, the scenery and the dialogue while omitting others. So they streamline the intent. So a realistic world, but the elements have been chosen to underline thematic concerns. So you would see part of the house or you might see the, the house as though it's cut in half. So you can see the attic, you can see them walking up the stairs, but you're always aware that you're looking through the front wall into the house and you see just part of it. The new stagecraft was a movement in set design with Adolf Appia and Gordon Craig. And this is the term modern expressionism. So they want to create or express the mood and the atmosphere of the play, express the imaginative life of the play. So they want to really infuse the play with additional emotion through the set. So how can you do that? Well, it's not exactly realism, but maybe Maybe the set is slightly off kilter. Maybe the lines are slightly wiggly. The walls aren't completely even and flat. Appian and Craig influenced many designers. Joel Mel Joe Melziner, Boris Aronson, and Ming Cho Lee. Ming Cho Lee is still alive. He's, he was teaching at the Yale School of Drama for decades and had a, an event called... Um, the clam bake. And Ming Cho Lee's clam bake was one of the most elite events in the world for any student, an MFA graduate student coming out and designed to show their work to professionals. It was held in New York and people vied for entry into that particular event. Now we have several different design showcases around the country, but one of them, one of the primary ones or prominent ones is at UCLA called Design, Design Showcase West, it's in June of every year, because the clam bake is no longer, um, that has gone by the wayside because Ming Cho Lee is no longer active there, so. The influence of Appia and Craig are seen even through to today because Ming Cho Lee was a direct descendant of their um, school of thought, and he's still well respected in the design field. Appia's big, overarching theme is that lighting should be fuse all the visual elements into a unified whole. And when we talk about lighting later, you'll see that he really elevates lighting to a mythical standard and that it is absolutely the most important thing in design. And when you think about it and you think about the advent of electricity, and how remarkable that was, I think that's what he's responding to is this absolute wonderment that now we have controllability. But, you know, this, I would say that's not, no longer the case. It's simply one person's opinion. So scenic design is visual storytelling. They visualize a detail of a place, the location where the story takes place, or a geographic location, or an urban or suburban or rural environment. They visualize the movement, how the actors can move through space in that place, and what are the objects that are taking up space. So, you know, if you're going to have a very big couch, or you're going to have a very big, um, Amoir that because somebody has to jump out of it, how big of a, how much real estate on stage does this take up? So the set designer very carefully looks at each particular object and places them incredibly carefully, communicating through sketches and models and drafts the ground plan. So that is a technical um, drawing using a scale of be one quarter to one inch or one eighth of an inch to one to one inch uh, to one foot sorry one quarter of an inch equals one foot or one eighth of an inch equals one foot so that the ground plan we discussed this last time the ground plan is that shows the shape and the dimension of the playing area as seen from above technically as seen from about three feet above the ground 
because that way you can see where the windows are, where the openings are of the doorways, and uh, then also where furniture is. And generally you see the furniture from the top. Shows the entrances, exits, windows, walls, and major properties. And we went through that last time with the director. The scene designer works closely with the technical director. And we're gonna talk about that more when we talk about craft next week. The technical director drafts the construction details. So as where the scenic designer drafts the front elevation, the technical director turns the drawing over and drafts the construction details. This is how we're gonna make that wall. This is how we're gonna make that stair step. This is how we're gonna make that piece of furniture and then drafts that very specifically and then supervises the construction from drawing to the dimensional because it's then his drawing that is interpreting the designer's expression. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. The shop foreman is the boss of the shop to interpret the drawings of the technical director to create the three-dimensional piece from the technical director's drawings. So they'll do a cut list, they'll do, um, uh, they'll do a work flow process for finishing the scenery in the amount of time that is required. And the shop foreman works specifically with the head carpenter to make sure that the building is appropriately parsed out so that it will be done in time and on budget. The design process is true for costume, lighting, sound, as well as scenic. So even though it, it shows up when they talk about the scenic element, it really is the same for everyone. The first and most important element is to read the script. When you get stuck, you go back to the script. When you, when you can't really wrap your head around a particular idea or maybe a particular element, and you're really struggling with something, you go back and read the script. What, what in this script can touch my heart? Why are we doing this script at this time for this audience? What's the meaning of it? What's the purpose? You know, otherwise it's a big waste of time. It's so much work. It takes so long. It's, it, the work is so detailed and there's an amount of minutia that you can't even imagine. It's like, why would we do this unless there really is something there that touches your heart. So you read the script and you know the script. That's why I had you do the cross plot because we're gonna work on the Tempest. And yes, William, it is our, um, a group project. It's our final project. You will be graded individually, it's 100 points. And you need to read the script. So the cross plot gives you that one page roadmap so that you can actually see where everything is in the script you will focus on one particular scene when you're working on The Tempest. The design process next determines the director's approach. And this is, uh, can be very interesting. Sometimes it requires translation, like what the heck is he talking about? Or what is she talking about? Or, you know, the director is just talking in circles all the time and I can't figure out what's going on. I can't, I can't actually like pin down the idea. I can't find it. And in that case, what you do is show and tell. Here, is this what you're talking about? Is how do you respond to this particular image? What does this tell you? What is this telling you? And this is the kind of thing you go to the director and say, is this what you're thinking about? Because you can't understand the director's language is not visual. And so you want to make sure that you're actually talking about the same thing. So there is, there is show and tell through drawings, through models, through sketches, through mood boards, through PowerPoint, through uh, collaging things together, through looking at past things, referencing um, art objects, referencing movies, referencing paintings, to just try and get on the same page so that you can translate what is the director's approach. What are they really taking away from this play? Then you can go to research. Your research is, is helping to establish this director's approach and helping to establish a context. So you're looking at the historical period. 
Maybe you're choosing to move the play from the historical period. Very, very common in uh, Shakespeare. I've done it in 1930s, futuristic. Um, today, 1960s, you know, can, it can take place anywhere. And that is true with The Tempest. It's a, it's a fantastical piece. And the, the piece that you're going to read this week, which is Un Tempest, uh, Un Temp, uh, which is Ami César's interpretation of The Tempest in 1969. He's a black man. He takes the point of view of Ariel and Caliban both being slaves. So this is the post-colonial viewpoint. And it's very interesting reworking of this exact same play responding to Shakespeare. And so I've given you some historical context for it. For Shakespeare's writing, there's some timelines that you can see when slave trade started and what Shakespeare's responding to, and then Emmy Césaire's response to that particular play. You look at the social context of the play when it was written. What might the play have influenced the playwright? What is the playwright trying to get across to the audience? And of course, on, in some cases, we really don't have any idea. So we're making our best guess based on these kinds of things. What is going on in the playwright's time period that the playwright would write this kind of a play? What is the background style? Meaning what was happening in this time period for architecture, furniture, fashion? How are these things related to each other? Often like in medieval, when we have the very tall spires of uh, Cathedral de Notre Dame, the fashion is the same with very tall spires in terms of the hen and hat sticking out in a very tall point, which we can think of as the dunce cap, but with a veil on it. So these things often reflect one another. And then you determine what elements are essential. What do you really need? How many chairs do you need? How many sit spots? How many costumes do you actually need? Do you need to change a costume here? Or really, is it an actor modification that needs to happen? So there's, there's all kinds of things. Sometimes I remember doing a sitcom and I said, this is not a sitcom, this is a fashion show. You have the lead changing 14 times because it's in 14 different days. I said, this is, this, how, what's the story? So when they, when they start getting sort of wound up in themselves, this is of course when you're working with a sitcom, you're working with an original script. And they, when they don't really have an idea, the, they start putting things onto other departments. So that one happened to be on the costume department. Costume design. What is costume design? It really is a social psychology of dress. Dress is a term that means anything that can be put on your body. There are indigenous dress, fancy dress, corporate dress. So it, instead of saying the social psychology of costume or of fashion, it really is what did people actually wear in every kind of context? And how did that represent the socioeconomic class, the age of the character, the occupation of the character, the geography? Where are they? Well, if you're wearing, if it's winter and you're talking about Christmas and you're wearing fur coats, you're somewhere cold. The weather the time period, time of day, time of year or season, and relationships. And sometimes relationships we can think of as team colors. So in the same way that you have two sports teams and you can tell the players apart because they're wearing two specifically different colors. That's why there's so many refined rules about away team and home team and what color you, you're using and what uniform you have, that's a costume. That is dress. You have a relationship between one side and the other side. So we can, we can take that into Shakespeare and just loosely talk about Romeo and Juliet, where we have the Capulets and the Montague. 
and they too can be color coded. When you get start getting a stage crowded with possibly, we said that Shakespeare worked with a troupe of 12, but with possibly even more, then you can um, help by looking at things through color eyes. The costume designer makes visible the world of the character. Costume includes the, the world of the character through all of these things we just talked about, the social psychology of dress. What are the costume elements and what is included? It's all the character's garments, the accessories, jewelry, purse, gloves, hair, face and body makeup and masks. Sometimes an element of jewelry or you add purses and gloves can give you place you very specifically in a time period. Last summer when we did How to Succeed in Business and we did it in the early 60s, it was very specific. Women wore gloves to work, they carried a handbag, they wore a hat, they took their hat off at work. When they went out to lunch, they put it back on. So you, there is a whole social moray and a group of actions that a character needs to employ to adequately address all of the character's garments and accessories. So it's something that the costume designer has to work very, very carefully with the director and then with the actor once the director is on the same page and if the director has the confidence and trust in the designer that they're going to stick with the director's vision the designer communicates with sketches drawings mood boards does breakdowns talks through costume changes so that the actor can be very 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 careful so that they can be comfortable Often an actor doesn't feel as though they are in their character until they get their shoes. The costume designer works with the costume supervisor or manager in the costume shop in the same way that the set designer works with the technical director. The costume supervisor does the measurements, schedules the fittings, the designer comes to all the fittings to make sure that the clothes are fitting exactly the way they should be for that particular character, for that time period, for their particular social status. Also, the designer attends dress rehearsals. Oh, misspelling, the costume crew. Interfaces with the costume crew with regards to quick changes and the kinds of costume maintenance. Just a moment. <coughs> the costume maintenance that must happen during the run of a show. If you're going to wear the same garment for 21 times as we do at Santa Barbara Theater Group, then you wanna make sure that that garment is durable. The garment has appropriate um, reinforced stitching, depending on how fast that garment needs to come on and off. Or does that garment come off on stage and then we see the lining, so it has to be period perfect inside and out. Those things create wear and tear on the garment, on the costume. And you probably know that from your own wardrobe. When you take clothes off, if you throw them on the floor and walk on them, and then you wash them, and then you dry them, and then you put them back on, they probably don't last as long as if they were hung up or hand washed or air dried or you know any number of different kinds of things. Costume design also includes the makeup, masks, and hair. So I like to say that costume design starts above the head and goes below the floor. So the entire figure is included. And even if you have a makeup and hair designer, they will interface to the costume designer. And the costume designer is often the one that has been doing the research for weeks and weeks and weeks and the makeup designer may be hired very late in the game like just before technical rehearsals or often they're brought in for photo call and then they have to play catch up very quickly so i generally try to provide very um high definition close-ups of a particular time period in both hair and makeup so that they can see exactly the you know the eyeliner the attitude of the lipstick, the, the um, is this person wearing a beauty mark? What is the quality of the skin at this time? So those are things that you want to keep in mind. 
Makeup enhances the actor, helps reveal the character through the makeup. When you're on a stage that's more than 20 feet away, it's hard to see. If they don't have some sort of lip definition, you really have a hard time hearing them speak because you can't see their mouth moving. It's really, really clear now when we're all wearing masks how hard it is to hear people speak because you can't see their mouth. So when theater, very, very important that there is some enhanced straight makeup, which just highlights the actor's features and makes them more visible so that you have a more clear way of understanding the actor as the character. And this is presuming that the actor is the same age as the character, doesn't need to have any major makeup uh, transformation. When we get into that, that would be character makeup. It transforms the actor's features. It can reveal age. It could reveal attitude. It could reveal an injury. It can reveal an illness. It can be, it can show a, an urban life, which would be soft, corporate, pasty skin versus rural, working outside, rougher skin, much more weathered look. And maybe you're not changing the age of the character, you're just changing the texture of the skin. So in Santa Barbara Theater Group, we always cast age appropriate. If we need an 80 year old person, we find one because anyone in our community can audition for a play. And if they are very, very excited, we have incredibly accomplished actors in Santa Barbara that will come and work on the play and they are community, highly skilled community actors of years and years, and they work for free. They become a student. They enroll in a theater production class so that just like you, they're covered by insurance, they're covered by um, parking, and they have the same privileges as including free bus. <laughs> when we ever get back to campus and you get your bus pass, you will have free bus and transportation service when you're at, at Santa Barbara City College, which is incredible. According to Actors' Equity, which is the union that governs actors on stage, AEA, the makeup is usually applied by the actor. Customary and ordinary makeup, the actor is responsible for. The actor is responsible to provide their own makeup. When you get into a fantasy makeup, that's the responsibility of a makeup designer. Then you would be providing a particular kind of makeup, a particular kind of possible training if the actor wishes to do their own makeup or you provide a makeup artist to support the actor and complete the makeup on them. So last year when we did Sense and Sensibility, we had a man in drag playing uh, Mrs. Bennett and hilarious young man playing a 65 year old woman. So we had a makeup artist that came in and applied the makeup, you know, covering the beard is one of the biggest um, difficulties. And then down to um, glasses, wig, lips, eyes, whatever. <coughs> it could also be as simple as something like the, the actor has to be green. That happens both in Rocky Horror Picture Show, it happens in Wicked, it happens in several different kinds of things when maybe the actor's dead, maybe you're going to do Walking Dead. So those are not ordinary makeups. Those would be the responsibility of a makeup designer and a makeup artist to apply the makeup to the actor. Masks are included in and underneath costume design. They are an applied piece of three dimension that goes on top of the face. They can be just eyes, they can be three quarters, so they cover eyes and nose and the mouth is free, or they can be a full mask. The Greek mask is much like what we saw of Julie Taymor last time in the Spider-Man. She sculpts in a very Greek fashion where she creates an oversized mask and the amplified emotions are what are revealed. In fact, in Greek masks, there was a slight megaphone effect because there, 
to the from the mouth out was a, a, a smaller opening at the mouth and then wider as it got to the edge of the mask and that could actually physically amplify the sound so not only was the emotional gesture incorporated into the mask but the sound of the voice was amplified through this inherent built-in megaphone effect in the mask a mask creates a different presence on stage and it uh i think i showed you some pictures of sense and sensibility last year where the gossips wore the masks and so when they came on they actually had a physical posture that was different they had a head attitude that was different and they became all of one persona to create a chorus called the gossips which is reflecting the social mores of the time and it it is can be a very much a bigger than life moment changing position of a mask can change the expression of a mask and we'll look at the lion king when scar puts his mask down from on top of the head to the face and you see a very different interpretation of the mask and that's one of the most beautiful in the making of lion king wigs and hair design are the costume designers responsibility to establish what is appropriate for the period what kind of hair this is one of the biggest struggles that we have often I was on a movie where we were doing 1964, actually, no, no, 63, because it discussed one of the elements of the movie was um, the assassination of JFK. So that is a very specific time reference. And we were working with both African-American and white actors. It was a, in, taking place in Kansas City, so we had African-American as help and the makeup artist or the hairstylist insisted that the actor could wear a, an afro and it, they were supposed to be watching the assassination of the uh, funeral of jfk on tv and i said you know the afro wasn't even invented until angela davis in 1967 and we can't you can't really predate this and this is a person who is uh the help in an um uh, a white established household. And I actually had an African-American costume supervisor with me. And she said, absolutely, they would be wearing a press and perm flat hairstyle. So, oh, we went tooth and nail over this. It's like, yes, you can't wear an Afro. It's just not period. You don't always win those battles. So it is the costume designer's responsibility to show all the research that happens along with that and why it would be appropriate and correct for that particular character if their hair cannot do the style that is required by the character then you use a wig and a wig often is fabulous because a wig gives you consistency where many many younger actors in particular are not adept at hairstyling you know they basically know down and a ponytail and there is a lot more elaborate hairstyles that happened even as recently as the 80s when we had the uh, very elaborate shag haircut that was so famously brought forth by Farrah Fawcett. And the hair completes the look. So they say it's the crowning glory and it definitely completes the look. Before we go on to the lighting designer, I'm going to just stop share. I have to remove this little icon thing. There we go. <clears throat> Whoops. Now I've hidden it and I can't find it. Oh dear. Here we go. I'm going to pause the recording because it's time to take a break. We're going to finish up talking about lighting and sound designers, and then we'll see if there are any questions. And we'll briefly chat about the project, the final project. But on Wednesday, I'm going to emphasize the final project. So let me do any questions so far, Oscar. 
Yes? No? <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, you know, this is to me where the world of theater really comes to life is when we start talking about the difference between just reading the script and realizing the script in three-dimensional form for an audience. Because up until this point, we don't really take into consideration what is the audience going to see. And now we're at exactly that point. Because remember, we can have a play and we can have a great script. We can have a theatrical space. But until we get the three people, the three elements, actor, space, audience, and we're telling that story, we don't have a play performance production. So now we're getting into the visuals of that. Let me just um, find my PowerPoint. Looking for it. There were a couple of different uh, things, so we're just gonna do it this way. Okay. We're gonna go into lighting design. And let me get a presentation. Okay. So a lighting designer helps focus the audience's attention for the meaning of the play. You know, if you are, if you're putting a light somewhere and everything else is dark, pretty much the audience is going to look where you have the light. So they do have a lot of control. It's really, it's amazing and, and remarkable and mysterious because people don't really understand electricity. You know, I think one of the reasons why costume design is so, um, is so thought of as somewhat ordinary is because everyone puts on their clothes. They put on their pants one leg at a time, just like whatever the character does. But lighting is this particularly mysterious thing where you plug something into a wall and an instrument lights up. It's magic. It really is theater magic. So the background for this is there were ancient productions had dramatic effect with torches, fire, sunlight. We'll wait for the giant truck. Sorry about that. So ancient productions had dramatic effect with torches, fire, and sunlight. So even in the Greek uh, Colosseum, in the Greek, oh, with the orchestra, we would see torches placed around to illuminate at nighttime. There was fire. They could bring in lit torches. There was a fire building in the center so that you could see people around the firelight. And also using sunlight. Remember, they were there all day. In medieval times, we have the outdoor. Remember, we have mansion stages where they went from from a still place to a still place to a still place from beginning to the end of a play. We also had the pageant wagons. So we, they were always outdoors. Again, same thing, we used torches, flame, smoke, and then reflecting metals creating a spotlight. If you put a reflective metal in front of a torch, you can throw the light to a specific destination and that creates the first early spotlights. In the Renaissance, we had general illumination with candles. Candles were placed in chandeliers. They were placed in wall sconces. And if you've ever even seen a wall sconce in a contemporary home, you can see that if it's wide at the top, you get a big throw of light above that, and there would be a narrow throw of light below that. So wall sconces. A candle was placed in a holder with a reflective uh, part behind that. And then, you know what, I'm going to have to take a quick break and take this phone call. 
All right, let's go back to screen share and we'll see about lighting design. Okay, so we are talking about wall sconces. In the Renaissance, they used colored glass, oil lamps. All of these things created illumination. Really trying to adjust what the audience sees. In the 19th century, gas lighting allowed flexibility. So gas was piped in through tubes and then came out. So it wasn't just a one candle. It wasn't just an oil lamp with a certain finite amount of oil. They would have, you know, almost an unlimited amount of gas. It allowed for flexibility, brightness. However, it created heat, fumes, and fire. And this is when we got the fire curtain because theaters were burning up the um, stage would catch on fire and that would, could go create a vacuum from the backstage to the front stage up through the house and the audience would be in danger. So that's when the fire curtain came into play. We still have that because there are oftentimes when we use um, fire, but also the powerful lights are very, very hot and they can also create a fire situation. When electricity came in, it transformed lighting design possibilities. What that meant was it was controllable. It could be on and off. It didn't have to be lit and then heat up and then we see a light. It was a switch. It could be dimmer or brighter. It could be in a small area with one instrument. It could be a practical instrument such as a lamp. So now we can get much more specific when we have electricity. And here's our friend Adolf Appia in his book, Music and Stage Lighting from the last part of the, of the 19th century. It says lighting should be the guiding principle of all design. It sets down the modern stage lighting practices in his book, Music and Stage Lighting. And he defined the role of moder modern lighting designer and really created the mystery around the modern lighting designer. So that was pretty, pretty profound. And it lasted for a long time. And like I said, there's still a mystery over lighting because it's, you know, you take this, this inanimate object, you plug it in, and it does something completely different. So it really is the art of light. Jean Rosenthal was a woman who was instrumental in defining lighting design, a very amazing practitioner of design. She saw it as the air through which objects and people are seen. And I, to me, what struck me with the quote was that, First, she's putting the objects and then putting the people. And I think this is another difference between scenic and lighting and costume. In costume, it is the character. The character is first. But in scenic, and particularly if you're a scenic designer, also your lighting designer, sometimes they're lighting the scenery and not lighting the character. So it's a it's a very interesting to me that in this quote she puts object before people. But visibility and ambience are inherent to the total theatrical design. We have to be able to see the actor as the character. We want to see them in some kind of an atmosphere that helps define what the space is. The tools of the lighting designer our form, color, and movement. Like we have tools for everything. We have tools for the playwright. We have tools for the actor. We have tools for the lighting designer. Form, which is the shape of the light's pattern. We talked about that with the sconce. Does it go up or down? Turn on your lights. Practice turning your lights on at home. What is the shape of the light that is emitted through that particular lamp or through that overhead ceiling fixture or through a you know, a, a pin spot or through a 
mini mag light or through your computer as it's shining, the screen is shining on you at night. So what is the shape of that light? Is it diffused and rather amorphous, unshaped, or is it very specific? And if you have a shade on a lamp, you're gonna get a very specific shape from that defining perimeter of the form of light. One of the tools is color, and this is achieved through the use of color media placed in front of the lens through the filters and colored gel. They're cut and they have a bracketed uh, metal piece that the gel goes into and that is placed in front of the lens, in front of the lamp itself. And then movement is any change in form, color, or intensity. So intensity is the brightness of the instrument or the dimness. And if you have an instrument at a dim color, you're gonna have a warmer color. If you have it at a brighter color, you have it at a cooler color often. So even color temperature is something that you can adjust and control with movement. By now the process should be familiar. Read the script, meet the director, meet the other designers, read the script again, formulate some ideas. The lighting designer often deals with textural words, sometimes can give images. Uh, I think weather related images are really the best. I've been giving you some for Tempest. And then does a very mechanical thing and drafts a light plot. This is a drawing superimposed on the stage floor and the ground plan which includes all the lights as seen from above. And there's a grid that is above, a way of hanging lighting instruments. So it shows all of the lighting instruments hanging on those particular spots and where they'd be a rough focus, where their, where their um, barrel is gonna be pointed and puts all of the different kinds of instruments. It includes the type of light, the size of the instrument, the wattage, is it a 1000K, is it, what is it? What color, meaning what color gel media is gonna be put in front of that? What is the focus? Is it focused on a particular area for ambient lighting? Is it focused on a particular chair? Is something happening in a certain particular place? And then the circuits, which indicates the electrical, what lamp gets plugged into which circuit, which gets plugged into which controllable thing at the other end so that your board operator can control it. Lighting designer has assistants. Actually, almost all designers have some kind of assistant. For some reason, they call out lighting designer. The lighting assistant lighting designer helps prepare the light plot and acts as a liaison between the designer and the stage electrician. Sometimes the assistant comes to the stage before the designer. So the designer may be working multiple shows and have one assistant per show and the assistant will be the person that's in residence. And then because they know the designer's work, they can translate that to the electrician. In terms of placement, the electrician is a person that is going to oversee the safety issues, make sure that the execution of design hanging of the instruments on the pipe or on the grid is according to the light plot and the assistant lighting designer has a better way of translating that because they've worked with the designer before. The master electrician generally comes with the theater and is responsible for executing the design. In other words, getting all of the instruments according to size, shape, wattage, color, up on the grid or the lighting battens according to the light plot that's been prepared by the lighting designer. The electrician maintains the equipment, make sure that it's all working, that the barn doors can open and close, they can shutter down the lights, they can shape the light that way, and addresses any lighting issues through the run of the play. Now we get to the lighting board operator who runs the light cues. All, now almost always they're computer generated and computer timed so that if you push a button, you're gonna have a 10 second crossfade. In the 
in the not too distant past, it was all manually done so that a lighting board operator was much like a symphony conductor. They, would, they had the controllability of bringing the light down and taking the light up at a variable speed, depending on what was going on on stage. They could go faster. They could slow it down if something was happening. They could do an absolute bump cue where it came, comes up immediately. And so now they, you know, con consistency comes with the computer because it'll be the same time every time. You're going to just push a button and it'll be a 30 second fade. But if something's happening on stage, it's hard to slow that down. So, you know, some, to me, some of the poetry is gone, but the reliability is up. You have to decide and choose what is going to be your best, um, your best weapon. Sound design. Again, the sound designer goes back to the ancient Greece. Think about how many things go to the ancient Greece. Everything, really. You know, certainly scenic when we had the um, scana in the background. They're definitely wearing a costume. The lighting that they have with um, torches and flares. And now we're talking about sound. So the Greek employed drums, pipes, lyres, a, a very small hand harp, and chanting. So when people processed into the playing space, you could hear them coming. It was very exciting. The pipe might indicate a certain kind of character trait. In medieval times, adding bells and tambourines, and when you think of the, um, the street players and gestures happening, that there could also be acrobatic and their sound if they put it on different parts of their body that you'd be able to hear it if it's like bells around their ankles or around their hands, and if something's percussive, you could hear that. Elizabethan gets a lot more sophisticated. Um, they actually shot off cannons. They did built thunder runs, which is a wooden trough for cannonballs to go thundering down so that you could hear this out in the house. This would be all backstage. Thunder sheets, which is a hanging thin metal sheet that you can then uh, manipulate back and forth to create thunder and to create other sorts of wind sound. And that is still in use today. Some of these things are still in use today. Victorian becomes, gets a, several different kinds of mechanical um, effects like doorbells and wind machines that are operated by the prop master. So now we're adding another technician to run the sound, in addition to whatever the actors are bringing. So in the Greek and medieval, definitely those are actor driven, the drums and the pipes. Or, and the particularly could be with the chorus, the Greek chorus could be um, amplifying all these different sounds. Modern sound design, the, your book credits with the 1980s, and I think it did actually come for that. So I put a question mark, you know, it was, something that was always thought of. Um, the sound in the theater was serving many purposes long before the 1980s. Definitely, you're enhancing sound for clarity and volume. It evokes the mood, establishes period. It heightens the tension of it. And you know from watching movies how much that can heighten the tension of it, intensify the action, it can stick you on the edge of your seat and provide transitions. And this, this idea of transitions is so critical in theater because you know, we don't stop the camera rolling, the audience is sitting there when we move from one scene to the next. So we need to make sure that the transitions are as entertaining as the content and that they add to the content. And often sound is a thing that can help provide it. If a character goes from inside to outside for the next scene, you may suddenly hear a change in the soundscape from something that might have been a radio playing in the background to now we're hearing outdoor cricket sounds. So there's a wide variety of sound that can happen in the theater to enhance the atmosphere. So whether that modern sound design came in the 80s, I think that it was certainly happening before that. Just my, just my idea. So there is a controversy over sound designers and there's a debate over the electronic sound amplification in the theater. It's become very acceptable in musicals 
that the singers would wear a microphone because they're singing or an orchestra. And yet in opera, absolutely not. The voice is not amplified. Even in a large outdoor arena, the voice is not amplified. Then again, they're adding um, microphones to straight plays so that the actor's instrument of um, voice projection may not be as strong. And I think also because as more television actors go into plays, the training is different. The theaters are different. I mean, Broadway theaters are not that big, 1,200 seat. They're just three times the big of size of the Garvin. And yet sometimes even in the Garvin, they'll use a microphone for a straight play. And then you have to get used to the fact and you have to somehow marry your ear to the idea that the front of the audience can hear the actor's natural voice simultaneous, actually with a very slight delay to the amplified voice. So, you know, there's a debate continues over, over what to do and which is best. Often uh, the composer for musicals is also the sound designer, but it does not necessarily need to be the way that it is. A composer can write the music to the lyrics that's provided by the lyricist and for the book, but a sound designer can provide the soundscape that creates atmosphere. So they would definitely work together, but they definitely do not have to be the same person. And I think particularly now, it really reflects two different skill sets. What are the working methods of the sound designer? Same, studies the script, notes effects. If there's a physical effect like a door slam, a slap, marching up the stairs, which we heard in trifles, um, something that's really specific. And the same thing about when they transition from one location to another when they transition from a child's room to uh, an adult cocktail party, to a teenager's room, to um, indoors, to outdoors, what are the sounds that accompany each one of those locations? They meet with the director and designer with their notes very carefully already crafted to be able to plug into the director's vision and the other designers can see what's going on. The sound, Designer loves when the set designer gives them something to hang sound on to. So if there's things in the set that are inherent in movement, if there's rain and he's given them a metal roof, then we can hear that in a certain way. Then if it's a straw thatched roof where the rain would be very muted. So this sound designer works with the visuals that the set designer has provided to create a finished sound. Then generally these are written into the computer. The cues are given. And sometimes there's te just textures overlaid that is kind of a non-specific ambient drone sound in the background to create, um, again, environment. I went to a really amazing lecture once at the Museum of, of uh, LA County Museum of Art where the sound designer for Apocalypse Now came and, and talked about his method. And he said, the human ear can really only hear two and a half things at a time. So if you have one sound ongoing, you'll be able to accept a second sound. The minute you hear bring in a third sound, whether that's rustling of papers or whether that's rain or whether that's the voice, you're gonna drop part of the sound of something else out. So a sound designer has to be hyper vigilant to not overpower the actor's voice, but to make sure that the um, voice is well amplified and front and center of focus. Just a few last uh, comments on other kinds of design. Computer-aided design is CAD. All fields use computer-aided design now. It's used in um, superhero costumes, it's used in sound, it's used in lighting. As I said before, the boards are all computerized. It's used in scenic to do drafting. Computer-aided design is a drafting program where you can um, you put in your coordinates and it, and it will draft. Uh, oh man, the name's escaping me right now what the, the major drafting, oh, okay, I'll come back to it and I'll put it in here for the lecture. 
um, the major drafting piece of equipment that is uh, um, utilized in scenery now. There's a there's a uh, industry standard. And CAM, which is computer aided manufacturing, that's something where we have 3D printing. We printed, you know, we had to do this a whole knife gag and we did games afoot. We printed any number of different knives to have different kinds of blade shapes so that we could stab people, that they could be hanging out of their back, they could be hanging on the wall. And it's a very lightweight way of creating an exact replica of a particular object or of a prop. Projection design, oh sorry. Projection design is the fastest growing technology in the theater. You will find that almost every play in one way or another is using projection to create atmosphere, to create background, to create environment, to change mood. And then again, same thing, the lighting designer can hang things off of that if we're suddenly seeing a big rainscape in the background. Under technical production, we're going to be discussing this more later because it goes along with the craft of, of the crafts that execute the design. We have a production manager who oversees the entire process of going from design to stage three-dimensional realization. They generally handle the budget. They may do some kind of calendaring. The technical director not only does the um, drawings for the backside of the scenic designers um, design, but they also often do the calendar, set the calendar, and um, have the, the, I don't know, the say-so over when production photos happen or when they do happen. And all those things can be up to, sometimes the production manager handles that with marketing, sometimes the tech director handles it because they know how far along the set is. It needs to be a certain, a certain distance before they can shoot in front of it for a, pr a preliminary photo call. The costume shop manager is the one that handles the timeline for the costumes from the design aspect through measuring the actors, fitting the actors, making sure all the materials are procured. The designer often is responsible for procuring the materials, bringing all of the costumes in from wherever various places that they're having, scheduling the fittings, and then making sure that all of the alterations on the custom made pieces can happen and then that the assemblage of all of the costume elements are together for an actor. I like to keep those, I like to put those into the very first fitting so that the act, actor is well aware of all the items that they'll need to be handling and wearing. If they're wearing specific underwear, I try and give that to them. And they'll even have rehearsal corsets so that the actor can work with those as soon as possible. And then the production stage manager, which is the right hand man to the director, and then after the director sets everything, goes through dress rehearsal to opening, the production stage manager is the one that's going to be in the booth calling all the cues and making sure that the lines are said the same way that the director intended every single night. So they are the gatekeeper. They are the gatekeeper that the show that was set on opening is consistent through every performance to the end. And we'll be discussing more about stage management. So a lot of information today about design. And um, this is a, this is the, you know, this is my area of design it is my area. I've worked in all of those areas. I've done lighting design, sound, technical direction, scenic design, but I have really spent most of my time in costume. So I have spent a lot of time with costume. I've done mask work in Italy. I've done uh, everything from simple buckram masks like we did for Sense and Sensibility to much more elaborate masks where we had to face cast people and then um, put the um, mask on the actor so that it was completely fitted to carving wood sculptures of them and creating leather masks that then grow to the face so that they're really breathable and they're part of the actor's character from the very beginning. So that's my, um, particular, my particular interest. You might find that you have a different interest. So take a look at the videos that we have on Canvas. And there, each one of these is, um, there's a, there are a few minutes. The projection design one is longer because it is the newest of the fields. And it's the one that is really being embraced throughout all of theater right now. And if you like electronic devices, it's a really fabulous field to get into. 
And all of these are handled by the IATSC, the International Alliance for Stage Theatrical Employees and Allied Crafts. And that's the union that handles all of the designers and the craftspeople so that they are protected for both safety, they can have health and, and welfare benefits, so they can have health insurance and retirement, even though they work from various employers. So you may have as many as, uh, you know, let's say you're working two or three weeks on a project, you could have 15 different employers in one year. But if you are part of the union, they will contribute to your, to your collective bargaining agreement and you'll have your collective pot of retirement and health benefits. And that's based on the amount of hours that you put in. So let's wrap it up there and just see if we have any, any questions. Okay, so if you have no questions, I will get this, um, I will get this captioned as soon as possible. I realized the director one had not been posted, so I'll also work on posting that right away. All right, see you on Wednesday and look for um, the, the uh, final project information that's being introduced today because it, next week is our last week of class. So all of these to-dos have to be done by then. Oh, I know, I was gonna do one quick look at the to-do. Let's take a look at that. We never did get there. Um, let me go to, hmm, let, me, let me just see if I can get to the desktop and go to Canvas again. Because I do wanna show you about, The, uh, let me just move this. Nope. Okay. All right. Uh, anyway, on Canvas, please take a look at the to do. We have a to do at the beginning of Monday for every single week. And that gives you your list of things that we're going to be working on this week. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye.